Thank you for being here on a beautiful Saturday morning. I'm happy to have the opportunity to introduce my research to you. First, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who made this event possible, including people Myron Campbell and Fred Adams, who invited me to give this lecture. I want to point out, even though it's obvious that Fred exaggerated, right? USTC is not the very best, uh, one of the best and I'm one of the students in this uh, place. <laughs> and we also have a, a number of people, Carol, Monica, Carly, Warren. They have done a lot of work to enable or facilitate the talk. And a list on the right are a number of students, current and past students, who contributed to the work I'm going to present to you. Louder. Is this better? More? No. <laughs> OK. Good. All right, I also remembered Fred asking me to slow down a little bit. And I'm showing uh, three photos of uh, some of the students working with high pressure equipment there. And I'm going to introduce all the equipment to you one by one. The work we do are mostly funded by National Science Foundation and NASA. We also have uh, generous support from University of Michigan and the University of Illinois, where I worked before. And we also got funding from Sto uh, Sloan Foundation through the Deep Carbon Observatory and uh, from DOE through the Carnegie DOE Alliance uh, Center and then a fellowship from Columbia University. So some of us know that in Michigan, we have one of the first 10 International Dark Sky Park. Anybody been there? No? Oh, very few. So you have to go at some point. So this National, uh, International Dark Sky Park is located in the headlands. So if you drive about four hours from Ann Arbor north, before you cross the bridge, you'll get to the headlands, and that's where the International Dark Sky Park is. And if you go there on a night that is a new moon, right now is, uh, we have half moon. If you go to the new moon night, it's an, the sky would be totally dark. You cannot even see your fingers if you go there in the night. Totally dark. And if you look into the sky, you'll see the sky filled with stars. You can see the Milky Way there. So why do people go out of their way to leave the comfort and the fun in the city to see the darkness? Because where we are is one of life's persistent questions. We always wonder where we come from, where we are going. So little kids, without being taught, they would come to the parents to ask, where did I come from? And all of us, as we get older, we have pursued ambitions and happiness through life. We have tasted the joys of life. We have endured a lot of pains. But then, at some point, we're going to ask, what is the meaning of life? Where am I going? Is, are we alone in the universe? So we wonder about this question, and sometimes we go into the darkness to ask those questions. So here I'm showing a picture of a high school class that I brought to the International Dark Sky Park. After we saw the Milky Way in the darkness, we sat down around a campfire to talk about, you know, where are we? What is our position in the universe, in time and in space? And of course, our human minds are filled with imaginations. We know about this uh, film. Some of you guys probably watched it, Contact. So people were reaching out, trying to get signals to see if there's any aliens, intelligent life out there that are sending signals to us. And in the pop culture, we hear when women and men struggle to communicate, we say men are from Mars and women are from Venus, which means, you know, maybe at one point, we are not on planet Earth as we are today. We also have this idea, a suggestion, so-called panspermia. This idea says there will probably be 
precursors of life, microbial form, probably, that brought the genes, brought our genes to the Earth through maybe comet impact. So all these ideas out there, some of us probably have certain religion. We think we know answers to this question. Others are probably still searching. The fact that you came to the talk today means probably you are still searching or trying to check your answers. So how do we do that? One way is to looking outward. So more than 400 years ago, Galileo Galilei, he pointed the telescope to the sky and discovered the phases of Venus. So we know the moon has phases. Right now it's half moon. Venus also has phases. And Galileo was the first one to see those phases. And that helped us to figure out the sun instead of the Earth is the center of that solar system. And nowadays, we still point telescope to the sky. So what I'm showing here on the left is me at the International Dark Sky Park on a Perseids uh, media shower event. That's in August. Again, if you have time in August to go there, you can see media shower in the middle of August. So I have this uh, telescope looking at the sky. We can see the craters on the moon. We can see the uh, satellites, the moons of uh, Jupiter. That's what Galileo discovered more than 400 years ago. So we look outwards, and then the space exploration has really opened our eyes about what the universe is all about. So even though it was driven by a um, you know, post-war, Cold War kind of a, a driving force, but it gave us this huge eye-opening view of the universe, starting from 1957, the first artificial satellite to surround the Earth, and then 1969, the first step of humans on the moon, a giant step for the human race, a small step for the person who's astronaut who landed. And in 2012, just a few years ago, we have Voyager 1 going beyond the solar system, leaving the solar system at more than 120 astronomical units from here. 2015, we have the New Horizon visiting Pluto, which used to be the ninth planet, and it was kicked out and it did uh, demoted to be a dwarf planet. And in 2009, we have this Kepler telescope that started to observe the sky beyond the above the atmosphere and has returned more than 3,000 extra exoplanets that we know now, nowadays. So we look outwards, we see lots of things out there. But the Earth remains the only known habitable world to us. There's no other real Earth-like planets that we know now. We haven't found any real aliens yet. So people probably heard about the Drake equation. This is a way to estimate how many Earth-like planets should be out there. So if you think about how many sun-like stars are out there and how many planets would be within these sun-like stars and so on. So according to this equation, there should be 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, but we haven't seen them yet. So what do we do? There's a Greek saying, know thyself. So maybe we should turn backwards to look, understand the Earth. So we want to ask the question, what are the necessary conditions that we need to survive on Earth? And what are the enabling parameters that provides these kind of conditions. How likely are these conditions found elsewhere? And that probably will help us to See, perhaps also. This is what, what, not what I expected. <laughs> All right, looking at the Earth. One thing we notice is the Earth is really restless. We are actually living dangerously on this planet. We know, for instance, a famous earthquake in 1906, more than 100 years ago. It destroyed 80% of San Francisco. More than 3,000 people died in that earthquake. And more recently, we have an earthquake in Japan, and that one was devastating and questioned our use of nuclear power as a very promising you know, alternative for our energy needs. And we also sent tsunami waves throughout the Pacific Ocean. And we have volcanoes. One of the famous volcano was in 79 AD. That was explosive volcano. And that volcano actually froze people in ashes. 
So just a few months ago, in Castle Museum, right over here, we had a traveling exhibition of the Pompeii thing. Some of you guys saw that. And we also have more peaceful volcanic eruption in Hawaii. It's going on all the time. You have these lava, 1,000 degree uh, lava oozing out from the Earth. So these phenomena tell us the Earth is moving. And in Earth science, we have this unifying theory called plate tectonics. What it says is the Earth's surface, the lithosphere, the rigid part, they consist of a dozen or so uh, plates, rigid plates. They are probably about a dozen large plates and many small plates. So these plates would be moving constantly, slowly but constantly. And they, sometimes they move past each other, sometimes they move against each other, sometimes they move apart from each other. So these kind of movements, especially at the place where the oceanic plates, where the Pacific Ocean, for instance, when they subduct under the continental plates, you have so-called subduction zone. And that's the place you see so-called ring of fires, so lots of volcanic and earthquake activities over there. And if this is of any comforting effect, Michigan used to be a tropical place. The plates were moving around more than 500 million years ago. We have tropical very close to the equator. So not so cold in the winter. So we have those plates, we have those things. We have something else, which is the magnetic field. And Magnetic field played a really important role in our economic development, so navigation in the past when the star was covered by the cloud. So we still have the magnetic field we can use to guide us where we're going. And the birds, animals, they use the magnetic field for their migration. And in Michigan, we are very fortunate. We can observe the northern light. And the northern light supposedly is one of the, is on the top 10 list, actually top number one, of something you must see during your life. And this is an event that happened in 2011, October, a northern light. And this northern light is a result of the Earth's magnetic field interacting with the, uh, in the, the atmosphere, the uh, ions in the atmosphere. So we know these, all kinds of things going on on planet Earth. And that tells us the Earth interior is really dynamic. It's like a person. You do all kinds of things. That's because you have your heart pumping energy. You have all these organs working inside. And it's similar with the Earth. In the Earth, now we know there are two large convection cells. One is called a mantle convection, illustrated on the left. So on the geological time scale, the solid mantle, even though it's solid, it will be moving very, very slowly over geological time scale. And that kind of mental convection gives rise to the plate motion we observe on the surface. And then the magnetic field is because of dynamo function working in the Earth's core. And there is a molten magma chamber that things are moving constantly, and that generates the magnetic field. So we think maybe there are ways we can look inward to figure out what's going on inside the Earth, whether those dynamics has a very crucial effect on the Earth being a habitable planet. So if we look inward, seismology is a very powerful tool. When the earthquakes send waves through the Earth, we can detect the wave from other locations, and that will tell us the internal structure, give us information about what's going on inside the Earth. What I'm showing here on the left are two illustrations. So you have on the top a focus. This is the earthquake, where earthquake happens, and a wave travels through the Earth. And we notice there is so-called a shadow zone. This is S-wave shadow zone. And that's because when the wave hits the core mantle boundary, the core is largely molten. And the shear wave, it doesn't go through liquid. So therefore, you have a, the wave does not pass through that region. You have a huge zone that earthquake waves are not sensed on the other side of the globe. And then we also have something called P wave shadow zone, which are broken into two parts. That's because we have a inner core that is solid. Inside the molten core, there is a solid sphere in the very center of the Earth. So the 
presence of a large core in the inner core was discovered actually not too long ago. There will be people who are still living who have witnessed the discovery of the core and the inner core. One was in 1906 by Oldham. The other one is 1936 by Inger, uh, Inger Lemon. So if we think about the Earth's core, very often I'm looking for an analogy, how large is the core? It's not like apple core, it's not like peach cores. Those cores are too small. Actually, sometimes avocado would have the right size of the core. The core, the Earth's core is that large. It occupies more than half of the Earth's radius. If you look at the right side, you see that core mantle boundary is over here, 2,900 kilometers down from the surface. And the center of the Earth is at 6,300 kilometers. So the core occupies more than half of the Earth's radius. It occupies about one-sixth of the volume and 30% of the Earth's total mass, one-third of the total mass. So the core is so far away, we have no direct samples from the core. But we know, most of us probably know, we say the Earth's core is iron rich. It's mostly made of iron. More than 85% of the core's mass is iron. How do we know that? So the way we figure it out is by inference. We think the Earth, the Earth is made of material that's similar to chondrites, meteorites. So suppose the meteorites are the leftover things. If you're making a pizza, you have some leftover doughs. Then from the doughs composition, you know what the pizza is made of. So something like that. And we also have meteorites that's from so-called iron meteorites. This is a famous Fidmerstaten pattern. It's iron meteorites. It's a broken core of an asteroid a smaller asteroid from the asteroid belt. So if you know the bulk composition, you know roughly, you know, that's what it, and then this is the iron meteorite. And we have something called a mantle xenolith. Xenolith means, xeno means foreign, list means rock. So this is a rock that's trapped by magma and brought out to the surface. So it represents the mantle composition. So you can add these things up to see, okay, do they make sense? And somehow we think that if you do this calculation, mass balance calculation, it will make sense that the core is made of iron, mostly. But of course, this is still remains an inference. So how do we know? So we want to test the model of iron-rich core. And we take a materialistic approach, which means we take a piece of iron, we try to simulate the pressure temperature condition to see whether this iron can reproduce the density, the sound velocity properties of the core. Because those properties we can measure through seismic studies. So here we show the density increases. At the core mantle boundary, there's a huge jump. That jump, turns out, is consistent with the mantle mainly made of low density material, the core made of iron, high density material. We also have this wave called compressional wave. So this wave velocity increases, and then the core mantle boundary, it drops like this, because you have a molten iron. So the velocity in through the molten iron is much smaller. And you have the Vs, the red curve. This is shear velocity, as I mentioned before, because the core, the liquid core does not support shear. It drops all the way to zero as you reach the core mantle boundary. But when you get to the inner core boundary, then it appears again, and that's how we discovered there is a solid inner core existing in the center. So now the challenge is, if I have a piece of iron, I want to put it under the condition of the core, the pressure and the temperature of the, of the core. And you can imagine the pressure at the core is very high. Here what I'm showing is pressure. Pressure is force over area. And the unit of pressure, Pascal, is Newton over a meter squared. If you, have, you are an average person, average, I guess I'm talking about average man, 200 pounds, and has a shoe size of about 12, so there's one foot, square meters, roughly. If you calculate that, you will have a pressure of 10,000, roughly 10,000 Pascal, which if you translate into bar, atmospheric pressure, is one-tenth of a bar. That's how, how much pressure for a 200-pound person with 12 foot, uh, one foot, 12 shoe size standing there, how much pressure you would exert on the surface. But if you think about 
Michigan Stadium, we're proud of it. It has a huge capacity, can accommodate uh, 110,000 people. So if I roughly take 100,000 people, each person 200 pounds, a little bit on the large side, and you know, I don't weigh 200 pounds, and then you calculate one foot roughly, right? Mine would be a little bit smaller. So even though I'm less massive, but I also have smaller uh, feet area, so it probably balance out. If you do that calculation, you will figure out the pressure. Oh, that's what happens. You have one person on the bottom, you pile everybody up on top. It's all totally not realistic, but just imagine you do that. You get one gigapascal. Giga is 10 to the 12th. You get, or 10 to the 9th, so one, uh, get uh, one gigapascal. So, one gigapascal is a 10 k bar, 10 kilobar, 10,000 bar pressure. That's how much pressure you have. And then what is the pressure at the core then? If you look at the pressure scale in the universe, it's huge. Our universe is just so vast. The pressure in the universe spans 64 orders of magnitude. We know orders of magnitude. You know, some people make money 30,000 dollars a year. Other people make $300,000, so that's one order of magnitude difference. And here we have 64 orders of magnitude. From the hydrogen gas in the intergalactic space, that's very, very dilute, 10 to the minus 30 second, all the way to the center of a neutron star, which is 10 to the 30 second. So that's the range of pressure. And if you look at the pressure range inside the Earth, in the Earth, probably, so we would have this expanded range. It's 16 orders of magnitude. The best mechanical pump gets to about a 10 to the minus fifth or minus six. And in the very center of the Earth, we get to the 10 to the eighth. That is in terms of atmosphere pressure. So it's million bars we're talking about over here. So if you Look at the surface of the Earth. This is the atmospheric pressure, one bar. And here, the center of the Earth, we have 10, 100 million bars. That's how much pressure we have there. And if you put it, it's still related to what it is. If you do scuba diving, any of you guys have done scuba diving, every 10 meters you go down, the pressure increased by one bar. The world record is 330 meters. And if you go 10 bar pressure, you come back up, decompression, you get bends. So we are talking about a few bars that humans experience, basically up to tens of bars. At the ocean bottom, you have 100, a couple hundred bars. But at the center of the Earth, we're talking about 100 million bars. That's how much pressure we have there. So we have to simulate that pressure. How do we do that? How would you do that? So one way to generate high pressure is so-called a dynamic pressure. We know how a bullet or rocket works. In this case, the pressure equals to the rate of change in momentum. You punch, you get pressure. If you punch really fast, you get much higher pressure. So there is a dp, dt, p here represents momentum. So sorry for the confusion. Most of the time, we're talking about pressure. P would be pressure. Here is momentum. So and that depends on the velocity. Mass times the velocity and change like a function of the interval of time. So that's one way to generate a very high pressure. In fact, people did that, especially in the beginning. So these are shock wave experiments. And what I'm showing here on the left is a Caltech shock wave lab. So this is uh, uh, in the lab of our colleagues. Where you have is a huge room. The room is longer than this room, hallway over here. What you do is you really fire a bullet. You have ammunition in this lab. You would fire a bullet, and then it travels so fast and hit the target, generate a really high pressure. And this pressure will last only for a matter of a nanosecond. So you have to observe everything within this time window. That's a challenge. And then nowadays, we have something called a laser shock. So this happens in the National Ignition Facility. This is the Lawrence Livermore National Lab called NIF facility. <coughs> what this happens, usually we talk about the laser. I have a laser pointer over here. You think about the laser like this. But when you talk, look at this laser, we're talking about how many stories. The building has many stories. You would have all these optical instruments. You would try to focus laser light into a very small area try to simulate fusion, simulate what's going on in the sun. But you can also use this laser power to do very quick shock and generate a really high pressure. When you use this technique, you are able to get a terapascal. 
So we talk about gigapascal. Here we're talking about a terapascal, which is 10 to the 12th pascal, a thousand times more. We can reach temperature as high as 60,000 K. That's beyond our imagination. So that's what you can do with, but as I said, you have very little time to, to see anything. So alternatively, we can generate static pressure. So we all know this, push pin, because the force is limited. We could think about having all the people in a Michigan stadium piling up, but that's not realistic. What is more realistic is to focus a limited force onto an increasingly small area, because it's force over area. So, and also for that reason, people should be more respectful for women because they have high heels, very powerful. You don't want to be under <laughs> a high heel. That's the same principle. So how do we actually generate these kind of pressure? We use so-called diamond anvil cells. I have samples over here, and I forgot to mention, I also have samples of meteorites, iron meteorites, carbonaceous meteorites, mantle xenoliths. So afterwards, if you're interested, please come over to check them out. Diamond anvil cells. So diamond is the hardest <coughs> mineral out there, really the top. It's on a scale of 1 to 10. It's 10. So it can withstand very high pressure. What we do is to have a pair of diamonds, and then on the very culet, they would be pushing against a metal gasket. They cannot push against each other because they'll break. So if they push against the metal gasket, and the metal gasket kind of forms. Within the metal gasket, we would drill a little hole, put our samples there. We generate a very high pressure that way. In fact, the diamond anvil cells are very small. You can hold it with your hands, as you've seen over here. These are different kinds of diamond anvil cells. And you have diamonds inside. And the way you increase pressure, you just use hex wrenches to turn it. That's all you do. And you generate a very high pressure. We also need to generate high temperature. We know the core is molten, so temperature is really high. It had to melt iron under such pressure. What do you do to generate a very high temperature? Of course, you can use pass very high current through an electric kind of circuit. We do that sometimes. Another way is to use laser. Again, laser. So you can use laser to shine through diamonds. Diamonds happen to be so hard but transparent, which is marvelous. So we can shine laser through the diamonds. And the sample, some of the sample, if the wavelength is correct, they're going to absorb the laser light and get heated up. And here is an image of one of our experiments showing how we shine laser through the sample. The sample is uh, shining under the laser light, getting to very high temperature. Using this method, we can get to 6,000 Kelvin temperature. So of course, there is a trade-off. It's not that easy because of the push pin, if you think about it. When you get to this high pressure, your sample is tiny. It's micrometer-sized samples. So what I'm showing here is an image taken of a sample. 100 microns is the whole entire sample with a few pieces of different things inside on top of a culet of diamond looking through. And on the right, I'm illustrating a human hair, the black circle is a human hair. If you have black hair, it's probably similar to this uh, diameter, 75 microns. If you have a blonde hair, it's usually a little bit thinner, could be 40 microns. And we're also showing in Poland, 40 micron. Household dust, 4 micron. The, the, those 4 micron things actually can pass through your uh, lungs. So that's how small things are. And so we have to basically observe things at this micro scale. So how do we do that? If we do that in the lab, it will take us forever. We will be so old before we find any information. Fortunately, people have invented something called a synchrotron. So we can have very brilliant light from synchrotron, which are many, many orders of magnitude brighter, so therefore can get a lot of information within and focus on really small, tiny scale and, and allow us to probe the structural information, compositional information of material. This is an image I show of advanced photon source at Argonne National Lab, which is just 40 minutes away from Chicago. And so we, we have been to Argonne National Lab to do experiments. And what you're seeing is a ring 
that is about one mile in circumference. And you see all these buildings and the cars parked over there to scale. So that's a image of a synchrotron. And how does a synchrotron work? This one is an animation showing Australian synchrotron. What happens there is you have basically electrons gone, shoot the electron through a steel tube, and then they get accelerated through microwaves, and then they get injected into a ring. Within the ring, you have the magnets. What we're showing here is a magnets. Those would be bending the electrons, the very quickly moving electrons, near speed of the light. And then you're bending those electrons. As the electrons get bent, it will emit really brilliant light. And that light gets directed through different device, get to see the sample, and reveal the structural and the chemical composition of the sample. So give us information about the sample. So here we have an illustration from one of my former students showing how we could illuminate the interior of the Earth using the brilliant synchrotron light. We can do all kinds of measurements, and we're showing how you put a diamond cell over there. The synchrotron beam comes from the right, and you have all kinds of detectors over here to basically interrogate the sample for information such as X-ray diffraction, nuclear resonant inelastic scattering. Of course, these are really jargons you don't have to care about, synchrotron mass power. But it gives us a whole range of measurement of physical properties and chemical behavior of materials. And then what I'm showing here is a way we use to measure density. We want to measure density of iron under high pressure and high temperature, compare it with the Earth's core according to seismic measurement. And here we are, we are showing on the left is this huge detector, how you could capture the signal. And on the right is the kind of signal you would get. And then I have brought this thing just to illustrate what kind of information we are getting. So what I'm holding here, there are two sieves. One is a finer sieve. The other one is a, um, a coarser sieve. These sieves, they are very basically highly organized structure over here. You shine the laser lights through, you see so-called diffraction pattern. You see the arrangement of things inside. And if I do another sieve like this, you see that this is different because of a different density. So these kind of things will allow us to see how iron are spaced within the structure. When you squeeze it, how the space will change. We also see that if you don't have a crystalline structure, if you just have a, for instance, a piece of very loose, um, low density tissue, you do things like that, you see a diffuse thing, no pattern showing up because it's not organized structure. So with this kind of technique, we can measure the density of iron under the core conditions. So what we do, measure sound velocities, we use a different type of diamond cell. This one is called a panoramic cell. You notice that this cell has very large opening. What you do is you shine X-ray light through the diamond. You get probe very, very close to the sample to collect all the scattered X-rays. Those scattered things will reflect basically the vibrations in the sample. And those vibrations are what passes sound through. That, so then you can measure the spectrum shown on the right. And with the spectrum, doing some sophisticated manipulations, which we don't do on Saturday morning, but maybe on <laughs> Monday morning. And then we do these manipulations. We measure the velocity. We get the compressional wave velocity, the shear wave velocity. Those information we can get and compare with what seismic data tell us. So we were told the diamonds are forever. Here I'm showing you broken diamonds from our experiments. What you see on the left, on the top, is so-called ring crack. When we go beyond 60 gigapascal, that is the pressure still in the mantle, the Earth's mantle, mid part of the Earth's mantle. You see the ring cracks. And if you go to higher pressure, you see those really diamonds are cracking into pieces. Sometimes it shatters into powders. Of course, it breaks our heart because it's $1,000 a piece. We have $200,000 for each experiment. But we get some information when we do this. So here are some earlier data showing, if you look at that, this is every metal, every element. We just try everything. We measure everything to see which one matches up. 
And clearly, you see iron, 26 iron there, matches the dashed line over there. That is the core. So it's over here. You see that iron does a very good match. So that confirms our inference that the core is really mostly made of, the, made of iron. We can also take the temperature of the core. As I showed you, if you have a amorphous, that means not ordered material, you do x-ray diffraction, you get a signal that's diffused. And if it's solid, you get those crystalline, very uh, nice patterns. So based on that theory, if you increase the temperature, you see when this crystalline nice pattern disappears. You can measure at what temperature does iron melt at the core inner core boundary pressure. And we figured out that the iron would melt at something like 6,000 degree K. And if you adjust for some other things, we figured out at the inner core boundary, the temperature is at 5530 plus minus 500 K. We still have this large error bars because the experiments are very challenging. And turns out that this temperature is very close to the temperature we see of the sun, the photosphere of the sun, which is also about 5,000 K. So it's an interesting coincidence. At the center of the Earth, the surface of the sun, the temperatures are comparable. I don't know if there's a significance, but that's what we know. So now, if you look in more detail, you compare these, because as we refine our measurements, we see that what we are showing here is CMB is the core mental boundary, PREM is the primitive reference Earth model, the seismic model for the Earth. And ICB is the inner core boundary. You see the pressure, how density increases with pressure, because as you keep piling things up on top of it. And then on the right, we see the red things. That's measured data from diamond ammo cell experiment. And we see those blue dots. Those are measured data from shock wave experiments. We call it Hugonio. What we see is, that the density of iron is, in fact, a little bit higher than the seismic density. They're not really exactly on. There is a excess density. Iron is denser than the core. So that tells us that there must be elements that are lighter than iron in the core. There has to be lighter elements in the core. And the top candidates right now are hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, sulfur, and the silicon. These are elements that are lighter than iron. They have to be in the core in order to explain the, def the difference between the seismically observed density and the density of iron. Turns out, the presence of lighter elements has direct connection to the fact that we have a magnetic field running. The magnetic field is not to be taken for granted. If you look at the solar system, we find that magnetic fields are relatively rare. Among the terrestrial planets, we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Only Mercury and the Earth has magnetic field, and the Mercury has a very weak field. And if you look at all the moons, including the moons of giants, there are many, like tens of moons out there. There's only one moon that has a magnetic field. That is Ganymede, the largest moon of Jupiter. And we do think the dashed line shows that Mars probably had a magnetic field in the past. It lost it. And so did our moon. The moon had a magnetic field many, many billion years ago. It no longer has a magnetic field. So we know that the magnetic field protects life. We have solar wind coming from the sun constantly. Without the magnetic field protection, we would be bombarded with solar wind and probably cause all kinds of mutation, all kinds of other problems. In fact, it's more than that. It's been proposed that magnetic field is essential for us to keep the ocean and atmosphere. Without it, over time, the ocean and atmosphere would be ripped off. It is a long time, maybe 20 million years, but in geological time, it's not that long. So there was this uh, illustration of Earth today, Mars today. Right now, Mars has very thin atmosphere, less than 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. So you cannot breathe on Mars, not at all. But in the past, the Mars probably had oceans, had atmosphere. It lost its magnetic field, and maybe in association with it, it's the atmosphere and the oceans are gone. And also, nowadays, we depend so much on communications. Without the magnetic field, 
the telecommunication systems will be really disrupted. Sometimes we had a magnetic uh, storm, we would see huge disruption of service. And other technological infrastructure would also be affected. So the magnetic field is very important for us. How does the magnetic field work? How does the geodynamo work? Some of you guys probably learned that there are three critical conditions for magnetic field. One is it has to be electrically conducting material. It has to be molten, fluid material. It has to be moving constantly, convecting. That kind of convecting force, this whole thing, is how we call it a geodynamo. And it turns out the presence of the lighter elements is a, acting as antifreeze to keep the, core, the, the Earth's core molten. If you look at this, this is a phase diagram, which is really, really too much for a Saturday morning, but I'm going to show it so that you, so what we see is that you have iron and sulfur on one side. If you have a pure iron, the melting point at atmospheric pressure is 1800 K. But if you add some sulfur to it, it's going to lower the melting point. And if you add a little bit of sulfur, 10% lower to 1,600. If you had 30% sulfur, it will low, lower to 1,200K. So sulfur, the lighter elements, will act as anti phase to keep the core molten. And that's important for the core to have a magnetic field. We also, we know that the other conditions, so the dynamo works because the, the core is cooling. So the, earth ha the core has to be constantly cooling in order for the dynamo to work. If you, this is like if you have money in the savings account, it's not going to contribute to the economy. It's staying there. You have to be spending the money. You have to be cooling constantly in order for the economy to go. And the dynamo works in a similar way. And we also know that the mantle is basically made of ceramic material. It's very insulating. It's like a big jacket, you know, a winter jacket like the core is wearing. So we sometimes call the core is a mantle slave because the mantle allows the core to cool. If the mantle says, I'm not allowing you to, you to cool, the core is kind of basically heating up, not being able to cool, and the dynamo is not going to run. And another factor is the cooling slows with time. We know Fourier's law of heat conduction. These are for some motivated high school kids who probably have seen this, or college students. So if the temperature difference is large, things are going to cool fast. If the temperature difference is small, things are going to cool slowly. So in the beginning, when the Earth is really hot, it's cooling very fast. But over time, the cooling will slow down. And that's what we call energy crisis for the geodynamo. So we have the dynamo power over as a function of time. And the yellow bar shows the required power. And then this dashed line shows how the power, the thermal cooling power changes over time. As you see that very early on, 3.5 billion years ago or so, you already fall below the required power. So we would expect the dynamo should have shut off by that time. So how did we manage to maintain a dynamo for so long? And this is what this lighter elements are helping out. So this is called a thermochemical convection. What happens is at some point, the Earth starts to freeze grow an inner core. This inner core, if you look at this phase diagram again, you, look, you see that this big uh, arrow showing when you come down from a totally molten state, when you hit this curve there, I'm going to explain that curve a little bit, you will start to freeze. And then you will freeze this blue square. This is basically iron. And then you will left behind on this inner core boundary this red circle, which is enriched in the lighter elements. In this case, we use sulfur as an illustration. So that means during the core inner core growth, the lighter elements, the impurity, they got enriched. They got rejected by the growth. And then these kind of lighter elements, because they are light, they like to come up. They rise. And also, during the crystallization, there's latent heat. We know when you crystallize this, there will be heat coming up, because the crystal does not uh, take as much energy, does it not contain as much energy. So these two factors will drive the dynamo. And this is called a thermochemical convection. Turns out only 20% of the dynamo power comes from thermal nowadays, and 80% comes from the, the chemical convecting force. So that's good. We think we understand how we Earth maintain the, dyna the dynamo. But what about other planets? We have to test this on other planets in order to make sure that we really understand things. So look at Mercury. Mercury is very mysterious. So back in 1970s, when Mariner 10 went to Mercury, it discovered 
and Mercury has a global magnetic field like the Earth, which was a surprise because it's the smallest planet among the solar system. And it's supposed to have cooled really fast. And if you look at the surface of Mercury, it's covered with craters, like our moon. It's one of the three most cratered body in the solar system. Very old. But it has a magnetic field. And the field strength is only 1%, less than 1% of the Earth's strength, which is difficult to explain. And it's, the surface is old, but somehow the wrinkles on the surface of Mercury is much shallower than what we would expect. As we grow older, we get wrinkles. So supposedly, the older people have deeper wrinkles. But Mercury is old. The wrinkles are really shallow. And then another surprise is, in 2007, we found that Mercury's core is partially molten. We would expect such a small thing would have cooled down and totally froze uh, up. But uh, the core is molten. So now, how do we understand this? In order to understand what is happening in Mercury's core, we set off to do experiments. These are called multi-anvil experiments. What we are showing is a hydraulic press that is 1,000 ton in capacity. We have a demo over here. Maybe, Warren, you can show. We have a much smaller version over here, hydraulic press. And that's what, how we generate high pressure over a relatively large sample size. and the PSI. <laughs> about 200 bars. About 200 bars. And what we do, we go to 250 kilobars with this press, hydraulic press. That hydraulic press is 1,000 tons. This one is a few tons. So if you find that apparatus anywhere, it's always on the ground floor, nothing below it because it torn the elevator apart. When I was a student, it was delivered to Harvard. The elevator was torn apart. And this is showing you know, how you, you know, put your experiment in. So now, we did experiments with this apparatus. We want to know, how does Mercury's core freeze up? And I want to explain a little bit about so-called liquidus. Liquidus is a term. You, know, you come from Saturday morning physics. You get something actually very, very technical home. Right? Liquidus. When we, I was a grad, uh, postdoc at a Carnegie Institution of, uh, in Washington, we have this beer hour on Friday called Liquidus. What do you do if you go from solid, low temperature up? Everybody worked the whole week, stressed, and uh, everybody's not, not talking. And you drink some beer, you get across the eutectic melting point. It starts to partially melt. Some people will melt. But some people, like nerdy people like me, will take longer, more beer. Drink more, you get to this curve, totally molten. That's liquidus. So that happens in a material that has more than one component. If it's a single component, usually it just melts. It's called a melting point. Liquidus is the, the melting point of a mixture. And what we are measuring is, of course, in, the, in mercury, because we think it's a hot start. In the beginning, it's, it's hot. It's going cooling down. As it cools down, it's going to hit the liquidus. When it hits liquidus, it's going to crystallize and form the solid inner core. What we found, interestingly, is at the 10 GPA on the left, for this 10% sulfur, the liquidus temperature is, in fact, higher than this liquidus temperature at 14 GPA. If you plot like this, the liquidus temperature is going down with pressure, which you may not think of it as a big deal, but it's unusual. 
because for the Earth, it's the other way around. If you look at how the liquid temperature goes with pressure, it increases. And what I'm showing the adiabat, the blue line, that is the actual temperature of the core, we call it adiabat. So that also increases with pressure, but doesn't increase as fast. So the dotted line shows in the past, when the core was totally molten, the adiabat was at a higher temperature. And as the core cools, the temperature shifts down. At some point, it's going to hit the liquidus. When it hits liquidus, it's going to start to crystallize. That's why the Earth's core is crystallizing from the center, because it hits it at the highest pressure. So it starts to crystallize, and then it grows over time outwards. That's called a frozen heart. But on Mercury, because of this different shape, a different slope, when you have the adiabatic going down, the, the core cools down, it's going to hit the liquidus at the low pressure part. And its crystallization is going to happen at the shallow depths. And this is almost like snowing. So we would predict that Mercury would have a snowing core. Turns out that this scenario helps to explain Mercury's weak magnetic field. It has a field, but it's weak. So we had this paper uh, work published, and the Nature had a news featuring this, saying we have a forecast for the heart of Mercury. Mercury's, Mercury's core is snowing. Iron, like that. What about Mars? We know, some of you guys probably, some of us know, 2024, Mars 1 is going to land the first human on Mars. 2024 is not very far from now. But with Mars does not have a magnetic field, right? So that's going to be an issue. We have to be shielded. But with their work, including work from my group, predicting that in the future, Mercury, uh, Mars might actually restart its magnetic field. Its core might start snowing, or it might have a sulfide core, depending on the, the light element content of Martian core. We don't really know yet, so there's still uncertainty. But there's a prediction Mars might re restart its dynamo. And the moon, we have ambition for the moon. 2022, colonize the moon. So the moon does not have a magnetic field, and the record shows that it had a magnetic field at 4.2 to 3.5 mil billion years ago. That's a long time ago. And we want to know how did the moon sustain a dynamo for so long, and how did dynamo shut off? So there's some work from my group uh, on this subject. Of course, the magnetic field is not the only thing. We know that water is very important. We have a water planet, beautiful pictured rock, sedimentary process. We have the lakes. So water is definitely key to a habitable world. Now, where did the Earth's water come from? We have this recent mission um, to, to in investigate the comet, which gave us a surprise. The comet has very different water composition from the Earth. The, uh, the D2H ratio, deuterium to hydrogen ratio, differs significantly from the Earth, which implies we probably did not get water from comets, as some of us thought before. And we also have a discovery of a diamond inclusion coming from 600 kilometers below the Earth that carried a piece of mineral called the ringwoodite, named after the scientist Ringwood. So this mineral is at the transition zone of the Earth, and it contains 1% of water there which implies that there might be an ocean deep down in the Earth, the transitions on the blue ocean over there. So what was the origin of the, uh, water? So some of the uh, project we are working on is trying to understand the origin of water on Earth and the, how did the Earth get water. We also have these very um, serious concern about global warming, carbon. You know, carbon in the atmosphere. Venus has too much CO2, and uh, Mars has too little atmosphere altogether. So they had also CO2-rich atmosphere. So what happens with the Earth's carbon? We know carbon is so important because of the energy implication being the backbone of life. Also, super hard material, the, uh, the experiments we do use tungsten carbide, which has carbon. The volcanic eruptions spill out CO2 to the atmosphere. So carbon cycle actually involves not only the ocean, the atmosphere, but also deep interior. So if you look at the distribution of carbon, the atmosphere have 700 petagram over there. But if you look at the Earth's crust, a lot more. So most of the carbon, you would think, is in the crust. And the recent work from my group shows the inner core may be made of carbide. Maybe it's a steel inner core. And then if that's the case, we would expect that more than 90% of carbon has been sequestered by the core. 
So that would have implications on habitability. And if we compare these different bodies, you see that these are siblings. We, our sister and our little brother, they have very different environment, very different fate. And if you look at the moons of Jupiter, for instance, Ganymede and Callisto, these two are very similar otherwise, but one of them is differentiated with the internal ocean. The other one uh, has magnetic field. The other one is covered with craters. Three most cratered bodies, Callisto, Mercury, and the moon. So one is totally dead. The other one is much more dynamic. So what really caused this? Is this fate or is it luck? You know, do we have an orderly universe or do we have a stochastic process like we see in particle fever? I think some of you guys probably went to the screening. Also, we are asking a similar question. And the recent work was uh, in collaboration with uh, astrochemists, for instance, Ted Bergen, who is the chair of astronomy department here. We are trying to trace carbon from solar nebula to the center of the Earth to see what really is going on. We're comparing the Earth's carbon to nitrogen ratio with different things, interstellar medium, comets, different chondrites, and we're trying to understand what's happening. So the story is not very simple. And we know that the Earth has this rocky composition, but there are other kind of bodies out there, icy moons like Enceladus with geysers and underground oceans. We have a lake, methane lake on Titan. So there are other maybe exotic habitats out there we have to be open-minded about what kind of things can support life. And we have discovered so many exoplanets, and there are probably diamond planets out there. There are probably, you know, we have approached to more, more Earth-like planets through hot Jupiters, mini Neptunes, super Earth, and we're getting close to things like the recent discovery of Proxima Centauri b, which is very much Earth-like. We study the Earth, and if you have seen this all-time, one of the all-time favorite classical movies, Shawshank Redemption, Red made a remark that the geology is the study of pressure and time. That's all it takes, really, pressure and time. We're looking at time, deep time, so all these billions of years. When we encounter an Earth-like planet, maybe we are seeing a baby stage, we, maybe we're seeing an old person, so we have to be you know, aware whether we are seeing uh, this other planet at the, the what in what stage of development is it? Mm -hmm.